Hello humans, banana fans, those that have sufficient potassium intake, and the scattered descendants of Lord Cavendish. I'm Ryan Ferris, and welcome to the Cosmic Tortoise Podcast. This episode we are with Jackie Turner, who is the team leader for an upcoming documentary called Banana Geddon. We delve deep into the dark history and inner cog mechanisms of the big banana machine, including how bananas are produced the impact of the impeding extinction of the Cavendish banana globally, monoculture versus alternative agriculture systems, the power of the consumer, and everything else you could possibly wish to know about the world's favourite fruit. So, Jackie, first of all, thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, Thanks for um, reading the article and uh, being interested in the topic. Well, I love bananas. I actually just ate a banana literally two minutes ago, and I think it was my second banana today. So it's of high concern to me that bananas might be threatened. So why don't, yeah. we, why don't we start with maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself, what you studied, and what led you to applied ecology. Um, yeah, so uh, I majored in undergrad at the University of Michigan in environmental studies, which is a program called Program in the Environment, and film studies in a program called Screen Arts and Cultures, because the University of Michigan can never really call something what it is. Hmm. Um, But basically, uh, I had an interest in the environment, and I had an interest in film. And when I was placed for a study abroad program, I ended up in Costa Rica. And at the time, I was obsessed with fish ecology, like like counting fish in the river. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I thought that's what I was going to do for my project. But they took us to a banana plantation and introduced us to the workers there and a group of people who were trying to keep alive the last banana union in Costa Rica. And I realized that I I couldn't leave. Um, And so I ended up spending a month living on a Chiquita banana plantation and meeting the workers and learning all about how bananas are made. And I say made because it's it's essentially a factory-like process instead of a like what you'd picture for a typical farm. Um, and they're definitely not grown in a rainforest or in anything like that. It's, it's tens of thousands of plants, um, all exactly identical, growing in a huge piece of land that probably used to be rainforest. And so I learned a lot about the process and uh, I wrote, um, you know, my, th- my undergraduate thesis on the way people felt about the union and sort of the practices that the co- companies have sort of eked away at the, uh, the unions and the workers. And it was really, really life changing for me. And I went, I moved to Hollywood afterwards <laughs> um, and got into reality television. And I had actually moved out there to be part of a documentary and uh, the documentary didn't happen, and then I ended up in reality television and woke up about five years later and was like, oh, this isn't what I wanted to do, and then went back to apply for my master's and ended up in London, where I met a group of ecologists and biologists, and we started a documentary about bananas. Wow, that's... So Sorry, you just very, it's a very long story. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. So you, you sort of just fell straight into the banana, into the banana issue. Mm-hmm. Why don't we start at the basics of banana and then we can get into banana get in the documentary and all of the things surrounding that. So we all know that bananas are fruit and it's a very popular fruit, but what kind of fruit is it exactly? So it's actually a berry and it grows on a giant herb. So lots of people have this impression that bananas grow on trees and it's really important to mention that they don't grow on trees in neither the metaphorical or literal sense of (laughs) that phrase. So they grow on a giant herb, and what that means is that for each bunch of bananas that are grown, it's one 
plant that grows up, fruits, and then dies. So it's a lot of um, nutrients that go into creating these like, you know, 12 foot monsters because banana plants are huge. And once they produce that fruit, they get cut down and theoretically put back into the soil. But it's a very nutrient intensive process growing banana plants. Sorry, does that answer your question? That's exactly, exactly answers the question. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and the banana that we're going to talk about mostly today is the Cavendish banana, correct? Yes. So why, why don't you tell us about the Cavendish? So the Cavendish variety is actually the second major commercial variety to be sold in the States and in Europe. And also it's the variety that's sold in Australia and New Zealand. And this variety came about because we had an original variety called Big Mike or Gros Michel, which was the commercial variety, and it was wiped out by disease. And so Cavendish was the next commercial variety that everyone supplemented into these plantations. So if you buy a banana from Chiquita or you buy a banana from Dole, it's the same banana. It's actually genetically identical because the way that they grow Cavendish is that they just take clones. So the banana plant grows up and then a small offshoot comes off of the the base of the plant and they cut that off and turn it into a new banana plant. And that's how they reproduce. So there's no seeds involved, there's no pollinators involved, and that is how Cavendish is grown. The problem being that because they're grown in these huge monocultures, just like Big Mike, they're very susceptible to disease. And I just realized that my hair is over the microphone. Sorry about that. (laughs) It's okay. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so um, they're very susceptible to disease. And they're also not very flavorful. This is something that a lot of people don't have anything to compare to unless you were alive when Gros Michel was a the major commercial variety back in the 1950s or 40s, it wasn't, like, you you wouldn't know the difference between a tasty banana and a, and a Cavendish. Cavendish are actually one of the blander-tasting bananas. But because they're so, you know, popular, it's it's mostly just because they're not a taste that's going to offend anyone, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And that's why that's why the banana companies like them so much. And they've formed their whole production process around Cavendish. So, you know, the bananas have to be a certain size, they have to be a certain number on the bunch, and they measure them with calipers and then put them in these specially formed boxes. And all the boxes basically weigh the same because all the bananas are the same size. And lots and lots of bananas get thrown out. There's a lot of waste. But it's all, it's almost like we we interviewed someone for the film named Dan Copel, and he's found of saying that Cavendish bananas like fit in this, if you imagine like an oil pipeline going from like Central and South America to like the exporters, it's like the pipe is shaped a certain way and the only banana that will fit in that pipe is Cavendish. <laughs> yeah. like, so that gives you sort of a visual. And the Cavendish has kind of an interesting history, right? Wasn't it cultivated by some duke in, in England's it was, gardener? It was, a, it was a Lord Cavendish who... The, the origins of Cavendish, I think, are, are somewhat mysterious from what I've heard. It's... It originally came from a a greenhouse in England that was owned by Lord Cavendish. And I think it was, he says that the banana was given to him by some member of the church or something. And uh, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm misremembering this, but it's believed to have originally come from Southeast Asia and was brought over as sort of like a novelty for someone's garden or greenhouse. And then when there were problems happening with growing bananas in Central and South America, this banana somehow made its way from this greenhouse to Central and South America, and it was named after this Lord Cavendish because that's whose greenhouse it came from. And no one's entirely sure um, <laughs> its sort of pedigree, but it became it, it did really well because it was resistant at the time to the variety of, of diseases, Sigatoka and Panama disease, and that's why it became the banana we eat today. And I believe one specimen from the same place sparked the entire banana industry in Samoa, 
I, that's what I read at some point as well. So oh. quite, quite an, an interesting origin story for the, for the Cavendish. So what is banana getting? So the reason why we often uh, reference the story about Gros Michel is because the same thing is happening to Cavendish right now. Already in Southeast Asia and parts of Africa and even Australia, the Cavendish is being wiped out by a new strain of what's known as TR4, Panama disease, and it's it's devastating plantations, just just destroying them. And you ca- you can't cure it with chemicals. You can't even eradicate it from the soil in most cases, I think. And so it's 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 devastating not just to livelihoods and to bananas, but also to the land because it can't be used to grow bananas even after everything's been burned, um, which is how they usually deal with it. And um, yeah, it's uh, so Banana Geddon, the title of our documentary, is sort of playing off this idea that really Central and South America and the majority of the commercial industry is sort of on a knife's edge right now. All it takes is one, I mean, it's such a contagious disease. Literally all it takes is like one contaminated boot setting foot in like Costa Rica or, or Ecuador and it's game over for the Cavendish. Like it's, it's that, it's that contagious and it will spread. And we've, and they've, they're worried about it. You know, they make, when we went to visit plantations in Costa Rica for the documentary, they made us wash our boots before we entered the plantations, you know, the big ones, the smaller producers are still sort of don't know much about it. And it's actually sort of, they're not sure if it's going to affect the varieties that they grow, which is sort of the other part of the documentary. Some of the things that we're exploring is like, well, what if you know, we try to shift to multiple different varieties instead of just marketing one variety of banana, do we, can we reach out to small producers and get different varieties of bananas in our market? Because having multiple varieties means that the disease won't be able to spread as quickly. And so banana Geddon is sort of like, well, if it's the end of banana as we know it, what are the other options? What are people working on, dreaming up? And how could that apply to our future? What's the other variety? You mentioned that Cavendish is is big in the States, but it wasn't the dominant variety, right? Or it's or it's just slightly dominant. What's what's the other variety over there? No, so the the only variety is like ninety five percent of the bananas that are grown are Cavendish. Oh wow, okay. Or or dwarf Cavendish, which is still not genetically different enough. It's still susceptible to the same diseases, from my understanding. Right. But, you know, like the mini bananas you see yeah. are still a variety of Cavendish, like very closely related to it. And they're sterile clones, so they're genetically identical. So mm-hmm. if a disease comes, it just wipes the whole lot out, and there's not a lot we can do. So, so there's no way you c- anybody could... Uh, there's no way to engineer the uh, change in the genes or anything like that. It's basically you're stuck with it. People are trying. There, there are lots and lots of startups. There's a Guardian article that just came out yesterday talking about all of these big startups that are getting lots of money from banana companies and from other ag companies trying to engineer a new banana that will be resistant to TR4. It's, it, people are really, really worried about this. Like I said, and a lot of these are are very very clean looking, you know, lab type places, and they're hoping to genetically engineer a banana. But there is sort of a consumer wariness surrounding GMOs, and the banana market is something that people don't like to upset because it is one of those fruits where, you know, most of us would probably admit that we don't need bananas in our everyday life. However, they are the most popular fruit, and so the the big three banana companies are very wary of playing with the taste or even just experimenting with GMOs because a lot they perceive that a lot of consumers would be against it. Um, but there are companies that are trying to do it. Uh, the biggest problem is that because the bananas are sterile, you can't cross them the way you normally would cross plants. So it is taking it to a Petri dish level, basically. Mm-hmm. What's your opinion on petri dishing the banana out of the Cavendish out of extinction? Um, I, I think I'd be disappointed if that was the way out we took. Um, I, I see, like, I've, I've just sort of 
gone down the rabbit hole of all these companies that are getting lots of money for this, for these, you know, sort of experiments. And it, and it, it just makes me sort of uh, sad because there's so many small producers that are that are trying new things and doing and growing different varieties that I think consumers would really appreciate. And they're doing it in ways that are helpful to the environment and and don't use chemicals. And I think if these like big shiny startups, <laughs> you know, find a, a genetic solution in a lab that just encourages us to continue along the same path with commercial bananas, it's just going to be sort of a failure to seize an opportunity and, and try something new because it seems like we should we should really just try and change the whole system. I think that's one of the things that we really want to get across in the documentary is that this isn't this didn't happen just because of some flaw in the Cavendish. It's happening because there's a flaw in the entire banana agriculture system. You know, monoculture itself it causes these diseases to happen because when you grow tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of bananas in one place, you're going to get a high concentration of pests and a high concentration of disease. And if we want to eliminate that and maybe stop using so many chemicals, we're going to have to change that system. And just, you know, going and brewing up a new variety of banana isn't going to fix it. In fact, we're probably going to be faced with another disease in another 20 or 30 years. So it doesn't, it just sort of in my mind, it prolongs the the problem. It doesn't, it's a stopgap, a Band-Aid for a bullet hole, as it were, <laughs> mm, when mm. in reality, we need to rethink the, you know, agri-food systems that we rely on. Mm. It sort of seems sort of in parallel and a, a little bit analogous to the whole antibiotic superbug thing. They they find mm-hmm. a new antibiotic and then the, then the bugs adapt and then they find a new antibiotic and eventually they'll run out. And Yeah, yeah. it's exactly like that, yeah. Mm. The um, one of the people we interview in the documentary, her name is um, Angelina Sanderson Bellamy, and she went and did a bunch of insect trapping within banana plantations. And she sort of recalls this conversation she had with the uh, plant manager at one of the big banana companies and telling him that the insect counts were really, really low. And he was like, that's amazing. And she was like, no, it's not. Like, you you want, you want predator insects and prey insects. That's how you know an ecosystem is healthy and you know that, like, the, the pest insects are being kept in check. Whereas if you're constantly applying chemicals, you're killing your predator insects and the prey insects bounce up much quicker and you end up having to use more chemicals to kill them. So you really do need a knowledge of nature to really like modify the system in a way that you don't have to use so many chemicals. I mean, right now, I think the numbers are in Costa Rica, which also produces like papaya and pineapple for export, uh, but a third of the agrochemicals used in Costa Rica are used on bananas. And it's, it's so much more liters of chemicals per acre than it was even 20 years ago just because the insects are developing resistance the other pests the nematodes basically everything that plagues bananas which is essentially an entire like phylum (laughs) um it um (laughs) the kingdom of life it's it all develops resistances and when you operate a system that way you're just going to end up putting more and more and more and more chemicals on it and it doesn't really solve the problem so how are these smaller producers doing things? Are they also producing different species of banana or different types of banana? And are they using monoculture or are they using some different sort of agricultural methods to produce these bananas? Well, there's sort of a sliding scale. We have some producers we've met who are growing them in sort of a commercial style, but they're using far less chemicals. They're growing their bananas in sort of like a patchwork. So they'll have like the bananas in a section and then and then they'll leave some forest and then they'll have another so that it, there's like buffer zones between their plantations um, but they're still using some like a few chemicals on their bananas um, and that seems to be like a much softer system than like the you know dropping chemicals three times a day from an airplane that most of the bigger companies do and they also weed the plantations by hand 
which is a good which is a good way to cut out you know the the application of herbicide and then all the way down the scale we also have very very small producers and a lot of them either sell locally or they sell their bananas to be turned into like purees or chips you know things that have shelf life to be brought over overseas and those producers will grow multiple different varieties like Lacatan and Congo. Some of them even grow Gros Michel, which is like, you know, sort of a heritage variety at this point. And a lot of them don't realize that that used to be the commercial variety. It's just like what they grow because they like it and it tastes good. And they'll grow, so they'll grow three or four different varieties amongst cacao. So they'll also grow cacao to sell the beans for chocolate. And they'll also grow different kinds of fruit and they'll have like root vegetables growing amongst these plants. And this system is called agroforestry. And in some parts of Costa Rica, the Bribri people have been practicing this for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and it's a really, uh, it's a practice that they have depended on for even longer than banana has been around. And they've just sort of folded banana into this system where they can, you know, it's almost like having, you know, multiple different kinds of income. You know, if, if the banana doesn't do well one year, they can rely on their cacao production. And that for a small producer means everything. And they, those systems don't use any chemicals at all. How scalable do you think the smaller, these sort of polyculture or what, what were they called? Forest? What do you call it? Ag- Agroforestry systems. Agroforestry systems. How scalable are they compared to the massive, huge monoculture farms that we have um, in terms of export and providing bananas all across the globe? Yeah, so this is something we've thought a lot about because once you start to scale it, it becomes a bit more difficult. And I think one of the messages of the documentary is that maybe we need to start thinking in smaller building blocks for our agro food system. So we've all we've always, you know, had these like big, big monocultures and this idea of feeding the world with like huge swaths. But, you know, currently we produce, you know, two or three times the calories that we actually need to feed everybody on the planet. So I think as far as it being scalable, I think we have to rethink what scalable means. Maybe instead of having huge producers, we need to have lots and lots of small producers that, you know, turn their products rather than into, you know, table bananas or, you know, bananas still in their peel. Maybe the products that we eat that are bananas are, are you know, banana chips or banana purees or banana vinegar, you know, like maybe <laughs> yeah. we consume things differently to make allowances for the fact that, you know, smaller producers are less able to get these products fresh to European and, and um, uh, North American markets. So I don't, I don't know much about how, how, what the, the big scale would look like, but the documentary is very much an exploration of what it, what it would take to get it there. Tell us more about the other varieties. I'm sure people are curious. Um, are they different <laughs> colors? How do they taste? Et cetera, et cetera. And what's your favorite? They, oh, man. Um, my <laughs> fa- Okay, I'm going to start with my favorite. My favorite is a date banana, which I've only had once or twice. And it's, it's burned. The taste is like burned in my brain because it was just so good. <laughs> and I've actually never had the, the banana itself. I've only ever had dried banana. Wow. So, but it, the taste was that good. It does really taste like a date. And it's one of the producers that we visited in, um, in Costa Rica in the mountains who grows this banana. And it, it's a smaller banana than what we're used to. And it is like a dark brown. And when it's dehydrated, I'll admit it looks a little bit like poop, but it is so <laughs> yeah. good. And that's, that's called the date banana. And this grower that we visited also grows a number of other bananas, a couple of Indian varieties with names that I have difficulty pronouncing, but they're in, in different notes <laughs> around. And then there's also, like I mentioned, uh, Lakatan and Congo. And there are there's a variety called the red banana, which some people may have actually seen before. It's a banana in like a red peel, and it tastes sweeter than the Cavendish. We have a video that we're hopefully going to post soon where we had one of our, the members of our team try a bunch of bananas and try and 
describe the different flavors. But in some cases, it's so different because you're, you're eating the banana and even like the texture is a bit different. Some of them are denser and some of them are, are you know, a little more like uh, it, just different, different fruit textures. Yeah. Yeah. So your favorite's the date banana. Yeah. As far as you're aware, are there any of these other varieties of bananas being exported? I imagine places like Whole Foods or these sort of organic shops would yeah. might stock something like that. But so the there are a number of small grocery stores around. We visited a few. Um, there's a place called Berkeley Bowl in San Francisco, and there's a place called Seafood City in <laughs> Los Angeles. And both of them sell up to four or five different types of banana. Um, and they seem to be importing them primarily for an Asian market. Um, people who are used to buying bananas in Southeast Asia aren't used to just having Cavendish. In fact, a lot of the recent generation didn't grow up eating Cavendish. So it tastes quite bland to them because, because Cavendish has been wiped out in Southeast Asia. Oh, wow. So the varieties that they sell are, are things like Ladyfinger and Lakatan and I mean, they all, the, the thing that's difficult with banana varieties is that, and you, you can look this up on the internet, like there are different names for different varieties, so it can get really confusing. And I am still trying to find an expert in banana varieties for the documentary <laughs> because you, you hear one name and then you hear another name and it can get, it can get really confusing. But, um, yeah, there are a number of small grocery stores that seem to manage to import them. So when I hear from, you know, some of the bigger names that like, oh, it would be impossible to import this variety of banana because it wouldn't survive, you know, import or consumers wouldn't pay more for it. I see these small grocery stores doing it and I'm like, well, is there any reason why Whole Foods couldn't do it or why, you know, Tesco couldn't do it or, you know, any of the larger grocery stores? It seems like they should be offering their consumers more choices. Mm -hmm. So we've talked previously in the podcast about big banana the big conglomerates uh -huh. <laughs> such as Chiquita and Fife and Dole and some of the inherent issues within these companies. I mean, I'd heard about these sort of uh, basically wage slaves that, that are working in banana plantations and stuff like this, but I don't know a whole lot about it. How do you perceive these companies? And I mean, we've already talked about the way that they produce bananas, but how do you perceive these companies as a whole and the way their workers are and uh, their impacts on the economies of, of countries and and all that yeah their their history is not great <laughs> yeah um and i don't think that they can really deny that there's been a lot of human rights atrocities that have happened on the banana company's watch there's the massacre that happened in colombia i believe it was in 1928 that in, that was the massacre that inspired gabriela marcia Gar uh, marquez's book a uh, hundred years of solitude and it's, it's, I mean, bananas have a bloody history. That's something I, we don't intend to sugarcoat in the documentary. But I would say our, our, you know, the, we will talk about the fact that the, you know, workers have been exploited. The countries themselves have been exploited. You know, lots of the recent, or I say recent, like the last 50, 60, 70 years in Central America, there's been a lot of strife and political unrest, and a lot of that has been motivated un by underlying economic and financial issues caused by the banana companies, you know? A lot of the U.S.-backed overthrows have, have had deep, deep roots in the banana companies. You know, leaders who didn't support the banana companies or who said that they might try and give some of the land that belong to banana companies because they keep land reserves that are just, you know, endless amounts of jungle. And they basically keep it out of the hands of local people who may want to, you know, have their own banana farms. They keep that land out of their hands. And leaders who've said, oh, we want to give that land back to the people uh, have, have just like disappeared or been overthrown. So the banana companies have a very vested interest in keeping you know, themselves on top. And so they've, they've done a lot to make sure that there aren't any governments that oppose them or any, you know, unions even, you know, Costa Rica has only still only has one banana union. And when I went back and visited that union, when we were in Costa Rica, they were, you know, admitting that things were not looking good for, 
you know, continuing on. And, and that's really dangerous because the work that's being done in the plantations is dangerous. The workers inhale chemicals on a daily basis. A lot of times there's no protection between their houses and the plantation. So what I mentioned earlier about, you know, the, the planes dropping chemicals, you know, sometimes three times a day. Or you know, by chemicals, well, we're talking we're talking pesticides. Uh, sorry, agro. We're talking agrochemicals. So pesticides, herbicides, uh, fungicides, and um, they also spray on the ground. Um, what's called a neem? I think it's called a nematicide, but it, it kills nematodes in the soil. Um, and that's like you know, I don't know, four or five different kinds of classes of chemicals. Um, and they do rotate them, but all of those chemicals that end up in the air and in the water, drift over or run underground into the wells of the houses that are like right up against the plantations. And these are houses in many cases that are owned by these big companies and the workers rent them from them. Hmm. <laughs> and they pay basically for contaminated water and for breathing in that air. And it's, it's really awful. I talked to a number of men, a, a larger than... I would say normal number of men who lived alone with their wives and expressed regret over having not had kids. And when you ask them why, they just say, oh, God didn't bless me with kids, but it's a high rate of sterility. And there are lots of studies that have connected banana chemicals to male sterilization. So, and that's even like now, even though that started, you know, 40 years ago or more. That's still not a problem that the banana companies have addressed is this the chemicals cause real health problems. And yeah, it's, it's pretty serious. And so, you know, anything we do with the system going forward has to has to change that and address, you know, the fact that that humans, <laughs> humans grow this plant, you know, and that it has real effects on the environment and on their health. And there's a secondary influence of and economic influence of bananas, right? So more than 100 billion bananas are consumed worldwide each year. What are the economic implications of the Cavendish being wiped out? Well, we're about to go do an interview about that hmm. <laughs> tomorrow. I, It's hard to say because it's also, it's important on so many levels of the supply ladder. You have lots of transportation vessels that are made just for transporting bananas. So shipping containers that are refrigerated and, you know, shaped just for bananas. And you have, you know, not just the workers on the ground, but the trucks and the packing plants. And here you have ripening plants in, you know, the, the countries where they're being exported to. There's places where the bananas are taken in to ripen. There are workers in all of those different levels and also, you know, the number one, I think it's the number one item sold at Walmart is bananas, you know, <laughs> grocery markets stake a lot on people coming in to buy bananas and then buying other things. So the economic implications of, of losing the Cavendish and not being able to find a, a replacement or find a series of replacements uh, could potentially be pretty catastrophic economically and will would probably result in the loss of, of millions of jobs. And it's really hard to, to know even how many people work or depend entirely on the, on the banana industry um, wow. until I guess it's gone. <laughs> yeah. What's the time frame? do you think? How long, how much longer does the Cavendish have? It's hard to know because Basically, for the last two decades, experts have been saying 10 years. Yeah, right. And I think that's essentially just because they don't, they don't really know. There are lots of researchers doing modeling of how, you know, once you get one contaminated plantation in Central and South America, how long will it take for it to spread across the continent? Central and South America are, are connected by the Isthmus of Panama, so... It's essentially one landmass, and preventing the disease from spreading across one landmass has been very unsuccessful in Southeast Asia and in Africa. So I think 
once I think the the consensus is as soon as it hits Central and South America, it, it, it might be a lost cause. I think Israel has claimed to have cured the disease. And, and I'm on a bunch of forums with uh, banana experts, you know, like people commenting on stuff and everyone's hmm. basically like, that's bullshit. You can't cure it. <laughs> um, so, and I know that Australia has tried really hard to get rid of it as well, but so far no one, no one has been able to. So I think it it is definitely, if it does reach Central and South America, and I think it's just a matter of time, once it reaches there, the bananas will go commercially extinct within a handful of years. It will happen very suddenly, and there probably won't... I think one of the things we really want to push with this documentary is, like, once it starts in Central and South America, there won't be time to have a new... to build a new system. Like, we need to start now. We needed to have started 10 years ago trying to make a new banana system. And that's one of the things that we also heard from from one of our experts, Dan Copel. He was like, it doesn't really make sense to wait for the wipeout to remedy the wipeout. That's not how you solve problems. Yeah, it seems to be a sort of standard operating procedure as humanity, though. Oh, well. <laughs> Reactionary and all that. Yeah. So yeah. if this topples a big banana... What do you think would be an ideal future scenario for future banana cultivation and trade? I, uh, I mean, one, do you think that this would top a, top a big banana? Yeah. Two, would that be a good thing in the long run? And three, yeah, what do you think about the, what would be an ideal future scenario? Well, I think I would like to not see the toppling of some of the big banana conglomerates just for the reason that I think they're the ones who could potentially, if they you know, saw the forest for the trees, were to look at the big picture and say, this is something we want to invest in. We want to look at how we can bring in different banana varieties and start farming in a, in a real sustainable way. Um, I think a lot of people think when they buy, um, you know, they, they look at stickers on bananas and they think, you know, the certifications are really, really helping. And in a lot of cases, they're not. Um, the problems with the certifications are that they allow the companies to sort of greenwash their products without implementing huge change. Um, the work of Angelina Sanderson Bellamy, um, she did a, a paper comparing conventional plantations to rainforest alliance plantations and found virtually like no difference in the amount of biodiversity and environmental impact. Um, so are we talking... Okay, you mentioned Rainforest Alliance there. Are we also talking yeah. about, I mean, often I'm seeing in the supermarket fair trade organic bananas mm-hmm. and they're fr- there's a bunch of different kind of brands that have this. It's not just fair trade, the brands, but yeah. there's a few others. Are they actually any better than your standard sort of Chiquita banana or whatever? Um, I think they're, some of them are moving in the right direction. I think Rainforest Alliance is, is from what I've seen, a bit more of like the lower hanging fruit. So like they, they do the easy things that look good mm-hmm. yeah, and don't necessarily do things like intercropping or using fewer chemicals. They, they just sort of, you know, recycle their blue bags and plant some trees around it. <laughs> They're a PR firm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Essentially. Um, fair trade and organic, like, it, it sort of depends on what your your values are. So fair trade gives the workers pennies more, but it doesn't change the system of of inequality and exploitation in bananas. Like it's not like the workers get more of a say in how they're treated or how the system works. So it it, it guess it gets a little fairer, but it doesn't it doesn't change a lot of the like huge problems. And some of fair trade gets away with giving them more coupons or more money for I don't know maybe I'm getting into dangerous territory here but it 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 ultimately doesn't address the need for a system overhaul I think and organic does reduce the chemicals but because they're still being grown on a massive scale you still have problems with you're still going to have disease vulnerability because they're grown on this massive scale and so even though there are fewer chemicals used, eventually if the disease hits, those bananas aren't probably going to be organic anymore, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. 
So I think ultimately what would be great is if we started to move towards a system that values workers and the environment. And maybe it's something that gets a certification or maybe it's a different kind of system, but it needs to reevaluate from the bottom to the top. And I think the only people with that kind of power to do that are the big conglomerates. That's what I see right now. And I don't know that there's many like medium-sized powers around who could change it on their own. Earth University is one that maybe could. They're the ones that sell organic bananas to Whole Foods. And they're doing a lot of really great things. But they are not big enough to change the world. (laughs) And I think they would admit that too. Ideally, if there were several small companies like Earth, I think they would stand a chance. But I think what needs to happen is invite the the lar- the big three to grow a social conscience and come to the table in recognition of the impending disaster and really change what's happening. Um, yeah. The impeding Cavendish banana again could be seen as an opportunity for big banana to, to change. Yeah. And one of the things that we are really pushing for in this documentary is that Bananas should really be a story that all agri-food systems should pay attention to. As our world gets bigger, as you know, our demand for food gets greater, it's supposed to, I think, double in the next 30 years. We really have to start thinking about how we grow our food. The thing I hear over and over again from people that gets sort of old and frustrating is, People saying, oh, well, you know, organic food is nice, but organic can't feed the world. And and it, it it's a question that frustrates me because it doesn't, it makes several assumptions on, you know, what the world looks like and what organic requires. And, and a lot of those assumptions are, are somewhat false or all, all the way false. Um, and it fails to really ask the question, well, are we feeding the world with the methods we currently use? And the answer to that is no. We're kind of coming close to the end of our allotted time <laughs> here. And it's, <laughs> so I thought maybe we'll bring it to some slightly lighter, <laughs> lighter territory near the end. But before we do that, I'll just, just get your thoughts on this. So we've talked about in the podcast previously that companies – huge companies, especially big multinational conglomerates, begin to act as entities unto themselves and they seem to almost have a will of their own, regardless of often the collective will of all the shareholders. There might be a bunch of people that are holding shares in the company that have consciences that don't would rather not the company do horrible things. But because all the shareholders hold the goal of profit as the, as the single goal that they all share and they all want and they all want their their shares to grow over time that's the thing that comes out on top and that's the, the main motivator and, and driver of this entity of a company so it becomes very difficult when you combine that with the interconnectedness of globalization you know economies that are dependent on, upon one another if you stop trade of one good to another uh, both of them will suffer and and do less well than they would have before and that means individual suffering because they lose their livelihood and incomes so it's as the world's becoming increasingly interconnected with globalization and global trade plus the sort of giant companies that have almost the will of their own how do we how do we influence those companies how do we get in there and get them to change their ways and do you know of any do you have any examples? Uh, do you know of any examples of any large companies that have changed their practices uh, for the better? I think you bring up a really good point, and I think the answer is consumers. I think people have to want this change, and they have to pressure companies to make these changes. I think the plastics movement that's happening right now is a good example. Um, I'm not sure exactly where it originated, or that anybody knows, but you know, shows like 
planet Earth and Blue Planet sort of highlighted this idea that the, the plastics that we're producing are really harming the environment. And consumers have been, you know, pushing this, you know, less bags in the grocery stores, less packaging on fruits and vegetables. I don't know if you heard, I just heard about this the other day, but apparently consumers in the UK have been unpack like buying their groceries and then unpackaging them in the store and leaving the packaging all over the floor <laughs> great um to kind of show that like we don't need this um i kind of feel bad for whatever tesco employee has to sweep that up but it is i don't know if it's the same in new zealand but in the uk like the packaging has gotten a bit ridiculous where everything is in plastic yeah, but not bana- bananas um, are unwrapped sometimes. <laughs> like, they are on. wrapped too sometimes, which is crazy. Yeah. It's like yeah. if only there were a natural <laughs> wrapper <laughs> on on fruit and vegetables. Yeah. That's crazy. So and I know there's an argument for like, oh, it lasts longer, but you know, a lot of food waste could be prevented if we actually could see our fruit in the fridge, <laughs> I think. So yeah, the plastics movement, I think, is really interesting. And that's, you know, some a similar movement would be sort of our, our goal for this film. We would want people to start asking their grocery stores to carry bananas that are different varieties or asking them to carry different kinds of banana products and support small producers. That's sort of our ideal. But I don't know if it'll get as big as the plastics movement uh, that's currently going on. Yeah, I've heard of a supermarket that I th- believe opened last year in Germany that is completely packaging free. So you r- arrive and you can't get any, you have to just bring reusable packages. Presumably you could buy reusable package stuff there, like sort of your Tupperware sort of stuff. And they uh, definitely wouldn't stop plastic bags. I'm sort of on two sides on this. I totally get where you're coming from. And I, I think the consumer does have quite a bit of power because Every dollar spent is a dollar, basically a vote for whatever company that you're spending your money on. And the old classic, you know, if everybody does something, then things will change. But unfortunately, I don't have, I don't have a huge amount of faith in consumers because I don't think a lot of people have the time or energy to think about every, you know, if if you go through the supermarket and you look at every single food item that's imported there are very similar stories to the banana at the core of them. And it would take somebody, uh, a thesis, a doctorate to get through it all, if they could get through it all. And, you know, it's it seems to me like a hugely systemic problem. And I, I'm i more of a advocate for some more brute force sort of measures. For example, this one would be really simple, but if supermarkets simply said, we are not stocking plastic bags anymore, People, you know, people might get in a huff for a month or two, or if a gov- at a government level they just ban plastic bags in supermarkets. I mean, that people, uh, libertarians don't like interventionist governance, government stuff, and and all that. But not that I'm a libertarian, but you know, people like that say, "I'll oh, keep the government out of it." But I think there might be a place for that. You know, ban the plastic bags. People will get used to it within a month, and no, you know, no one's going to be on the street protesting for, to get plastic bags back in the supermarket. Uh, and I think a similar a similar thing could be done with a lot of the packaging in a supermarket if if there simply wasn't an option to have packaging there and there had to be you could change the the the, the, the structure of a supermarket itself so it is a giant container for food and then people can come and pick up the food. I think all of these things are, 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 would have a much bigger impact and take the pressure off the consumer and I also don't think it's fair to to blame the consumer too much because we sort of inherited these systems and the consumer guilt thing sometimes I think makes people feel apathetic and, and like, oh, you know, if it's all fucked anyway, who cares? That, that's the, that's, yeah, that's the sort I, of I mean, our, our, it's, it, it is a delicate thing because you want to empower people and make them believe that they can make the change. Um, and I think, but I think what you're proposing I don't know that governments and supermarkets would do it on their own. I think consumers have to, because they're all very cautious and tiptoe around the idea of even raising prices on bananas. I mean, that's, or, or you know, they want things to be as easy for their consumers as possible, um, price-wise and plastic-wise and convenience-wise. And they're, unless consumers say, no, it's all right to have, 
you know, no packaging or we'll bring our own bags. Like it, I don't think they'll make those changes on their own. So I see what you're saying, but I think there has, it has to start somewhere. They have to have some proof that it's going to be okay. And I don't think the governments will do it on their own either, unless people write letters. And I know it's a lot of, a lot of effort, but I would hope that some people would undertake a few of these tasks in their lifetime uh, under the banner of trying to all make the world a better place. And it's but a, maybe it's that's a that's a dream. <laughs> well, it's a dream, but it, it's also encouraging that it can go both ways. But it's encouraging that a vocal minority can get things done, and often do get things done. Uh, that can be really negative when you have low voter turnout for elections, or you have. Yeah, other policy changes because of vocal minority, but it can go the other way. It can be a vocal minority about plastic that really do put put the work in and talk about it, and then it changes it for everybody, and everybody else can be like, yeah, sure, you know, that's 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 encouraging. All right. And that can be your part. You can be somebody who, you know, sees a good idea and <laughs> and, uh, and goes with the flow. Yeah. That's that's all right too. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so I've got a couple of closing questions for you. Not not necessarily related to bananas, but they can be if you want them to be. Uh, first one, a book or film or TV series that most significantly changed the way that you saw the world? Oh. Oh, I wasn't prepared for this one. <laughs> Hang on. Um, well, I would say there were two books that motivated me to go back and do my master's at Imperial College. And one of them was Dan Barber's The Third Plate. Um, kind of on the, on the, in the realm of ethical eating, you know, there's a lot of evidence that the less meat we eat, the better it is for the environment. And Dan Barber's book is all about changing the face of the plate, you know, what a, what a plate of food looks like and making the meat much smaller and he talks about all these really great farming systems that are not conventional monocultures and how that may change, how, how more of our food systems might change to that in the future. And that was a huge influence on me thinking about what our food, current, food system currently looks like and what it could look like in the future. And then the, sec the second one was um, cultivating an ecological conscience, which is a farmer philosopher book um, and both of them are sitting on my shelf right now on a scale of one to ten one being least likely and ten being certain how likely do you think you are meeting your recommended daily intake of potassium uh ten yeah good <laughs> yeah um the th okay i'm just going to share this fact because lots of people are always like oh my god if bananas go to go extinct i don't know where i'm going to get potassium from Newsflash, lots of things have potassium in them. Vegetables. <laughs> uh, <laughs> lots, I mean, and this almost goes the same way as like protein. People think they need lots of protein. Like there are, these nutrients exist in all of our foods, not just meat, not just bananas, but like you can get protein and potassium from white beans and avocados. And there's actually like more potassium, I think, in an avocado than there is in a banana. But lots of people don't know that. Yeah. There's twice as much potassium in white beans as there are in bananas oh wow like a single serving yeah it's it's super powerful fantastic um yeah very good to know we've just been talking about potassium quite a lot on the last few podcasts it's sort of a oh yeah <laughs> thing with some friends and my friends and i so I had to ask you <laughs> cool <laughs> okay all right yeah. last question if you had 10 billion dollars to throw any tech development or environmental development in the world right now what would it be uh, ooh, um, seaweed agriculture or aquaculture. Whoa, cool. S yeah. Um, I think we underestimate what our oceans give to us. I mean, you think about two thirds of the world is covered in water. And I heard about this really cool project called Green Wave that's off of the coast. Uh, well, there, I think they're located in Chesapeake Bay. But they're talking about how they, they grow different kinds of seaweed. Lots of different kinds of seaweed are edible, but we only eat like one, ver one kind, similar to the bananas. Um, <laughs> and 
They're currently trying to work with chefs to get chefs to like use these seaweed in different kinds of cooking so that they'll become more palatable to consumers and more exciting in the culinary world. But essentially, I think their video, they were talking about how you can grow enough food to feed the world in like an aqua in a series of aqua farms covering the area of the state of Washington. If you grow things vertical, it's like 3D farming. So they're like grown on like, I'm explaining this terribly, but like seaweed is grown on like lines in the ocean. And then at the bottom are like oysters. And you also have like fish in the system and you can grow like all the, they're all really high protein foods. Like one of the reasons we eat, we eat fish is because they have all of these amazing oils and micronutrients and protein and all this. But where did the fish get those things? They get it from eating seaweed and things in the ocean. So the idea with the system is why don't we just eat those things? Um, sort of like an ocean vegetarianism type thing. And so this, this program called Green Wave is trying to make this a thing. And I think it would be cool to invest more money in that. Green Wave sounds like a stoner sort of electronic genre, music genre. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> probably, yeah, probably is too. But <laughs> probably a bit, of, sounds, probably a bit of that in there too. <laughs> yeah, sound, sounds good. Both both ways sound good. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense that they could grow a hell of a lot more if you're going down and not just growing things on a flat plane. Yeah. If you're going up and down and and you can grow in all in three dimensions, as you said, that's uh yeah, that's very exciting. I'm gonna, gonna check that out. Cool. Yeah. Well, how can people find you and your work and how can they support the upcoming documentary Banana Get In? Uh, you can find us on Twitter, uh, banana underscore truth, uh, or Instagram, banana underscore truth, or bananatruth.com. That is a link to our GoFundMe page. Um, we are currently still filming the documentary. We've done our trip to Costa Rica and we're now interviewing a series of researchers and um, uh, different academic types and also a few entrepreneurs and people um, over the next couple months. So we're still fundraising to get our film through post-production. And uh, if you'd like to get updates from us, you can send us an email at bananageddonfilm at gmail.com. And uh, we'll be updating people on the film and hopefully it will be finished in 2019 woohoo <laughs> that's great i'm definitely going to check that out and i wish you all the best with that i think you're doing such an amazing i think you're working with such an amazing project and bringing some really interesting things and important issues to light uh yeah so jackie thank you so much for your time thank you ryan and take care and all the best. Thanks. Thanks.